Hi there, everybody. Um, as Andy said, I'm uh, I'm a professor of uh, professor of computer science at Northwestern, uh, and actually a co-founder and chief scientist for a company called Narrative Science. And the important thing about that is that um, you have to understand I care deeply about the world of ideas, um, and I care equally as deeply about making sure that those ideas become real and have impact in the world. So I'm going to talk today about computers and language. Uh, the relationship uh, that we have with them and the language they use to talk with us. Uh, but before I do that, I'm going to tell you a tiny story. Um, now, the point of this story is not the point of the story. The point of this story is going to be that it is a story. Uh, and it's a story about my father. Um, <clears throat> and it's a very simple story. Uh, he was an orphan. And he became an archaeologist. Now, if you think about that for a moment, that means that what we're looking at is someone who had no notion of his own personal past, um, and he turned that into uh, an obsession with uncovering the past, digging up, literally speaking, the past of others. The short, story is very short, but you now have a fairly deep understanding of some aspect of my father, um, an understanding of where his pain was, what drove him, um, and actually why he became what he became. Uh, now, you get that not because I told you all that. You get that because you know about the world and how people work. And with a few pieces of information, a few facts, you can pull those facts together and turn them into a story in your head. But I can do that because I know what those facts are in your head. I know what those connections are in your head. And I can provide you with the facts that I know that you will now connect together to make a story. So, language. Language is more than words. Uh, language is our ability to tell stories, to explain and connect. And it allows us to communicate ideas, to talk about the past, to project into the future, and actually to, to share information about ourselves with, with others. And it is astounding. Uh, uh, it is actually miraculous. It is amazing that we are able to do this. Uh, and it is no surprise that this skill is uniquely human. You can teach a dog to fetch. Crows and otters use tools. Beavers build dams. And they're really not all that bright. <clears throat> but humans, humans we can tell each other stories about the world. We can actually look at the world, figure things out, and express it to others. But we have a new partner, uh, a partner that we are going to have to deal with uh, because every day it is getting smarter and smarter, um, and that's the machine. Now, my guess is that almost everyone in this room either has touched uh, something like Siri, uh, or uh, uh, something like uh, uh, Alexa, but the reality is that the machine still struggles with language. And these systems, as wonderful as they are, are systems that don't use language, they use words. And it's really not surprising. The model that everybody has is, oh, I want a computer that's just like the computer on Star Trek. I want to be able to talk to it and tell it things and interact with it. It'll be great, just like Star Trek. And then if you think about Star Trek for a moment, about the, uh, the, the next generation and Jean-Luc Picard, he's had a really horrible day. He goes into his, his stateroom and what does he do? He tea, asks, Earl Grey, hot. He asks for tea. Tea, Earl Grey, hot. Every time I see that, I just want the computer to say, why are you talking to me that way? Who talks to people that way? I've been watching you wander through the ship all day. I know we're in the middle of a battle. You've lost five crewmen. As you got closer and closer to here, I made you tea already. And of course, I know you want Earl Grey tea. You always want Earl Grey tea. And you had to actually tell me it was hot. <laughs> that's no way to talk to anyone. I love you, man. And that should be the interaction. But no, tea, Earl Grey hot. Those are words, but they're not language. Uh, we have to see what language is. Language is a window onto the world. It allows us to describe a chunk of the world to each other. 
That's what we use it for. Uh, and the machine, the machine is only going to have language. It's only going to have language when we teach it how to articulate what it knows to us. Uh, and that's going to be important because it knows a lot right now. It knows a tremendous amount right now. And it can say very, very, very little. I mean, it would be nice to think that there's a chunk of things that it knows and then there are things that it can say. And there's an overlap and, you know, and that overlap will get bigger. But what has been happening is not that. It's that the machine is know it knows more and more and more every single day. And we have not been teaching it. We have not been teaching it how to tell us about this. Um, and think about what it knows. I mean, in the early days, <coughs> the machine knew about itself. It knew how often, you know, how it was on. It knew about, you know, router traffic. Uh, it knew what applications were being run. It knew a little bit about the network. It knew about sort of its CPU utilization. It knew things about itself. But then we had a tiny change. And that is we opened up the world of search. We opened up the world of things that we could find. Um, and then it started knowing about our searches, our searches in particular. And then it started knowing about everything, absolutely everything. That is, it knows about our home, it knows about our car. You wear Fitbit, it knows about, your, it knows about how many steps you've taken. It knows about our mortgages, it knows about crime, it knows about traffic, it knows about every single financial, uh, financial interaction that has happened in the world. It knows about everything you buy if you buy online. It knows all of this. Uh, and in particular, and this includes, I have to admit this is cheating, this includes video. Uh, in particular, we generate 2.5 zettabytes of data every day. And you look at that and you go, what the hell is a zettabyte? What is he talking about? Um, this is the equivalent of a quarter of a million libraries of Congress generated every day. Every single day. So what does it know? It knows everything that can be metered and monitored. And what are we doing? We're making sure that we can meter and monitor everything. Because we want to know what's going on in the world. And if we can figure out how to find out what's going on in the world, we want to do it. We want to have sensors and, and data flow from every single device we ever touch. Our refrigerators, damn it, our toasters, our, the, the HVAC system in our homes, certainly our cars. We want all this information, and we want information about ourselves, our bodies, what we do, because we want to be able to make great decisions. There's a problem here, though, and that is we would like to think that the data is pretty and clean and wonderful, <coughs> and we can easily figure out what's going on in the world on the basis of it. Uh, and in fact, if you go to Google and you, you type in data and you go look for images, you get images like this that are so clean and matrix-like. But this is really what data looks like. And on a, on, this is on a good day. Uh, data looks like rows and columns or tree structures of numbers and symbols over and over and over again. Uh, these are often exposed as spreadsheets. I'm gonna ask a question now, and I'm gonna hope I can see the answer. Um, uh, uh, how many people, actually, give me a round of applause for the, if, if the answer to this following question is yes. How many people in the last month have looked at a spreadsheet? <laughs> yes. Uh, the spreadsheet, that is a, a table of data, rows and columns of data that you look for <coughs> insight from. You're trying to gather insight from them. But it's just data. That means that you are going to be looking for correlations. You're going to be looking for matches between things. You're going to be looking for trends. You are going to have to interpret the data we have given you. And I think one of the great sins of the technologists is that we gave you spreadsheets and we told you this was the right thing to give you. And you are going to have to figure stuff out on the basis of that thing that we just gave you. But spreadsheets are the tiniest version. We have tables now, we have tables now that are thousands of columns and millions upon millions of rows. You can't even look at that data anymore. You can't even understand, let alone understand that data. So we're struggling now. So what do we do with this data? 
all of this information, all of this stuff that could be very helpful to us, but we can't get to it. We can't quite figure it out. Fortunately, we have AI. Uh, and I really do mean fortunately. That is, systems that actually, by their nature, can look at things like data at scale. <coughs> but the issue is making sure the AI can talk to us and tell us things. So imagine for a moment that we start thinking about AI and we think, well, what are we going to do in terms of having it talk to us? Well, what we're going to have to do is give it something. And what we're going to give it is natural language generation, the ability to generate language. And when I say language here, I don't mean words. I mean language. I mean the stories and explanations and the connections that we give each other. So imagine this, or actually you don't even have to imagine it. It's right in front of you. The tiniest of spreadsheets, <coughs> two tables, one that has a list, of, a list on a quarterly basis of the sales for, um, uh, the sales for uh, either the a large widget or a small widget. That's all it is. And then another table that tells you, um, given that we've got a, nice, uh, we've got a nicely uh, uh, designed table, that tells you the names of these things. Now, almost anyone in this room, given a few minutes, could look at this, suss it out, and figure out what was going on in the world. Not what's going on in the data, but what's going on in the world on the basis of this. This is a product, this is sales, this is quarters. You've got two products, you've got a year. But what would be much more interesting would be to do this. Now, that little circle on the left, every time you see that circle from now on, that means a machine generated what you're looking at. A machine generated, not a human being, but a machine generated it. And what you get here is a description of the fact that the large widget is still doing better than the small widget, but it's on the decline while the small widget is on the rise. <coughs> a very simple observation that you could make, but a machine can make it. A machine can make this observation um, instantaneously. And you don't have to wrestle with that anymore. Um, instead, you just have to read it. So this is the notion of automatically generating language from facts, from information the machine knows, from things that the machine understands. But let's look at that spreadsheet again. Where are the facts? There are no facts here. It's columns and rows of data. In order to make this into facts, you actually do what you did with my earlier story. You look at this and you could figure out, oh, it's quarter. That means, oh, that's, that's some time. Um, um, a product, actually, that's some uh, just, you know, thing that is an identifier for some entity in the world. Sales, well, that's a metric I care about. I care about how well things sell. And then this other tab, you go, oh, that's the name of the thing. I know that. And you pull that together. And in order for a machine to tell you what's going on, it has to do the same thing. It has to look at that in order to get to a single, even a single sentence describing what's happening in the world, not just in the data. And so the notion here is that language actually requires that you understand the data, and you have to understand what the data mean. That is, you have to have a model of the world in your head. And when I say your head, I mean your head, and then the machine has to have the same thing. And this isn't just natural language generation. This is the idea of advanced natural language generation. The idea that what you've got to do is build systems that understand enough of the world, the world that we care about, so they can actually generate they can actually generate information for us, generate language for us, generate the stories that we care about. As I said, that's a nice idea. This is a nice implementation of that idea. Um, this is what Quill does. Quill looks at the world of data and turns it into the world of language. And again, not just words, but the stories, explanations, connections that we need to understand what's going on in the world. And it does so using three very straightforward steps. Um, <coughs> the first thing it does is when it's trying to connect that world of data with the world of us, the first thing it does is something that is very, 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 um, uh, that's very, very, very uh, uh, machine-like. It does some analysis of what's going on and generates a set of facts. Then it looks at those facts and it figures out what's more or less important. What am I going to tell you? And then once it figures out that and organizes it, it turns it into a story that is in language form, and it informs you. And this whole notion of data, facts, and language 
data, because that's the lens under the world, facts, because that's a characterization of what's happening, and then language is the way in which we and the machine can tell us things. That is what opens the world for us, and that is what allows the system, Quill, to look at the world of data and tell us about it. So what does this mean? It means that everyone in this room who raised their hand for spreadsheet is going to be able to put their hand down in a few years. Um, because imagine that you've got a spreadsheet that describes everything that's going on in your grocery store, but you're running a deli or you're running a bakery or you're running the dairy. You're not going to want to spend your time looking at all that data and wrestling with it. It's not what you do. You run a bakery. You're not a data analyst. Um, so instead of doing that, why not take that data and hand it to a system like Quill and have it tell you? Just tell you what's happening. And in fact, not only tell you what hap it's happening, but suggest to you that you might have some waste in some area. And there's a lot of waste over here. But then there's less waste over here. But the waste over here, it doesn't really matter that much. These aren't expensive things. You don't sell a lot of them. But there's the waste over here that you can actually fix and actually use so you can sell things. Of course, we don't all work in grocery stores. But a lot of us go to the beach. And it would be nice to know how... Uh, how healthy our beaches are. And one way to do that would be what Chicago does. Chicago has sensors all, in, all up and down the lakefront that really actually allow you to figure out the, uh, the, how, uh, the quality of the beach itself, the quality of the beach front, front on this day. Uh, the problem is it's in a massive table. And at any given day, my guess is there are five people in the city of Chicago who look at the table and figure out what's going on along the beaches. Maybe five. But you can take that and you can turn it into something else. You can turn it into something that actually tells you what the best beach is. That right now, this is the best beach. And much more important often is it'll tell you where the worst beach is. And if you were going to go to the worst beach, what do you want? What do you need? You need to know the best alternative, the one that's closest to you. And so you can take data that five people can understand and you can turn it into language that anyone who can read can understand. That every single parent who's thinking about going to the beach can understand. And you turn the world of data into the world of information. And finally, uh, there's testing. Again, a, a quick round of applause. Who has either had a child taking a standardized test or uh, has taken a standardized test in the last, I'll give you six months, six months. Standardized tests are all about the past, about looking backwards. Um, uh, the problem is, is that there's data there that's useful, but there's nobody who's going to be able to manage it and turn it into something effective. Um, um, it's fabulous data. It's wonderful data. Um, but it's all about the past, and it all is about a number. You got a 97. Great. What am I supposed to do with that? Well, that puts you in the 92nd, 92nd percentile. Great. What am I supposed to do with that? And instead, you can do something else. And that is, you can turn that data into information that can actually reshape the way we think about education. And sure, you start off with retrospective. Here's how you did. And maybe you did, some, you did badly in an area where other people are, people are doing well. But much more important, because I know what you did wrong, I can tell you how to fix it. And the data is there. The information is there but it has to be understood by the machine and then turned into language. Um, and as I said, that little circle means the machine generated it. That is a machine taking care of business for us in a way that we cannot, at scale, we cannot do in brick and mortar world. So it's really all about this notion of inform, of, of analyze, infer, and inform. Um, it's this notion of moving data to facts, facts into stories, stories into language. Um, and it's the language, uh, it's this language capability that will allow the machine to take everything it knows and tell us about it, to share its stories. Um, it's how we can humanize the machine. And in reality, uh, it's how we can turn the machine into a partner. And that's what Quill does. Thank you. <laughs>